Joshua, how much overlapping revelation is between the two? How how the uh, how Jesus is teaching you this is how this works, and 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 how God is teaching Joshua this is how this works, and some of the same terminology t- shows to each other. So you have a very general, broad parable spoken to the church. Then you have an individual all the way back in ancient times where it applies to, and you can look how it specifically applied to this man. And then we're going to take. My daily prayer and the Jesus challenge as the third leg of this stool. And we're going to tie all of this into daily prayer. And I'm going to show you the synergy that this tool has with these two other stories, if I can pull it off. I know that's a lot to chew in an hour, too. And now it's 58 minutes. So we got to get busy. So, Father, oh, man, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. In the name of Jesus, we rejoice in you. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we, we just we welcome you here. Uh, we rejoice in your presence here. Uh, you are the teacher. You're the instructor, and you're the guide here today. It, 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 it's through Jesus Christ that he has revealed to you the hearts that have, have been assembled here today. And, and I just entreat you to minister uh, to each one of us in, in, in the way that... that, that um, touches us individually at our point of need today. Uh, I thank you for bringing revelation as only you can do. Uh, I thank you for bringing something that, that bring, uh, for a teaching that is orderly, Father, that brings comprehension and edifies the finished work of the cross and does not introduce confusion here today. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah. So, it's always a matter of the heart. It's always a matter of the heart. It's always a matter of the heart. In second year, I taught every week, and I taught for the entire year a series that I titled, It's a Matter of the Heart. And, and I taught a lot of different subjects, but it always related to the heart. And today you're going to see, again, it's always about the heart. And I think we're going to start at um, 1 Samuel 13. I, I didn't mention that up front, but yeah, we're going to also talk about David. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14. And then I'm going to flip to Luke 8 verse 15, if you want to put your fingers on those two. 1 Samuel 13. Uh, what we're breaking into is the kingdom of Saul. And we're actually where, where, where Jesus talks about what exactly he's looking for in his servant. He's looking for a servant to lead his people. He's looking for a servant to pastor his people. He's looking for a a servant that he can promote into positions of influence to establish his church, his kingdom of heaven, which has been proclaimed as at hand, to establish that kingdom here on earth today. We've been talking about this against all odds, and the 30,000-foot view was taking a look at a country that's driving itself off a cliff. It, um, it, many people, over 50% of the people, believe that there was a duly elected president that through fraud wasn't actually put into office. We know this has occurred at the Senate level all the way back 70 years ago. Maybe it's already occurred at the, at, at the presidential level. We just never knew. But it, it was thrown in our face at the presidential level. We no longer have the freedom to elect our rulers. This is tyranny. This is the end of the freedom of religion in this country. It is the end of it. You can't, tyranny does not support the freedom of religion. And so if, what do we do as a group here that can actually change the trajectory of Washington, it's like it's against all odds. What can we do? And the answer is, well, we obviously could look at some things. We need some more influence. If we were really in a position of influence, uh, proximity to power is influence. So the greater, the higher you go in your, your authority and power, the greater the influence you have. If we could rise to one of these mountaintops and have this great and extraordinary influence, we might have a bigger say-so in, in shaping culture and in establishing the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit through a Christian nation that's already been established, right? We need more influence. 
And so you're going to see that Joshua was a man who was given more influence. David was an individual that was given more influence. And you're going to see in this verse here that, that there's something that God specifically identified in David when he called an end to Saul's reign. Saul may have reigned as king for another however many years. It's thought that David was only eight years old, maybe 12 years old, when this occurs, he was going to commit adultery with Bathsheba. He was going to have his one of his mighty men, one of his 30 mighty men, Uriah, her husband, executed or murdered. God saw all these things in David, but still said something over him. He still saw something else where he said, this is my leader. And notice he deposed the leader Years before his years before his exile, and he and he and he installed a man in power when he was eight, knowing the the, the way that God works, and knowing that David got a progressive revelation of God's delegated authority. If you follow his life story, there was things that David had to accomplish to fulfill this word in him. But God saw that he would accomplish those things, and therefore he spoke that this is who this man is today. And I'm telling you, for the people in this room, if you really want to rise up in the kingdom of heaven and make a difference, all you have to do is get a hold of this and say, I'm going to be determined or resolved to make this happen. And God's going to say, I saw that 20 years ago, and I've already prepared a place for you. I've already established your throne. We can go from zero to hero very, very, very quickly. We don't have to follow the world system of do this, do that, 10 years from now, schmooze all these other people to finally get promoted. God can take us from here to there because quite likely somebody in this room he saw was a person after their own heart and this has been spoken over you long ago in your life. And the person who's in the way right now has already been deposed and they don't even know it. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. This is, this is Saul, Samuel talking to, to Saul, or God speaking through Samuel to Saul. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Notice, he, his kingdom does continue for many more chapters in the book of Samuel. But God said, no, it isn't. It's no longer your kingdom. You may be hanging out and you may have the throne, but it ain't your kingdom anymore. Because I've given it to somebody else. 13 verse 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. He's already commanded you to be the captain over his people. It's already been done years and years and years ago. You're not waiting for a word. You've got the word, and you're going to see that there's a pattern that you can follow that's biblical that can make this thing manifest today time. If you believe the third great awakening is at hand, that means that we've got a 30 to 40 year run left in this country. Why not us? Why not? Amen. Why don't we steer that ship, right? Okay, and I believe that God's already commanded us to do it. But now, they, so the Lord has sought a man after his own heart. I gave you some of these definitions. Sought is to require. It's a verb. It's to demand. Man is a servant, a champion, or a great man or woman. Heart, which I've given you the defi definition, is the heart or the soul or the inner man. But it specifically is talking about a seat of courage. And this word courage is going to come back over and over and over on you. And it means inclination, resolution, or determination. This means that an individual is inclined to do something or, or they are resolved to do something and they're determined to do something. There, this is a, speaking of an individual that is purposeful in their plan. It, it speaks to somebody who obviously has a plan and has a strategy of execution. And you're going to find that, that, that God is going to command this to be a daily plan. And if it is a daily plan, knowing that life brings with it a lot of responsibility, it's going to have to be something simple, something manageable, and something achievable. And it's all, always going to have to be relevant to what's going on that day. And it's going to have to be something time sensitive so that it can be measured, so that you can see the move of God, and that elicits the praise and the testimony which destroys Satan. 
So whatever this thing is that, that we're going to be determined to do or resolved to do, it's going to ha- it can't be something huge and massive. It may have a lofty goal ahead of it, but there's got to be some simple process that we can do that's manageable, that doesn't discriminate amongst people, doesn't discriminate amongst race, doesn't discriminate amongst education. Okay, so he sought a man after his own heart. Notice uh, he has actually transferred authority from Saul to some other individual. This authority transfer has already occurred. It's not going to occur. It's occurred. It occurred at this moment. The definition of courage is to encounter danger and difficulties without fear or depression of spirits which would be considered the doubting heart or the wavering heart in James, the depression of spirits. Oh my goodness, my circumstances are now so large that I'm no longer going to focus on Christ. I'm going to focus on my circumstance. And and that thing is going to amplify. That thing is going to multiply. And the reality is I no longer have the fear of the Lord before my eyes. I have the fear of my circumstance before my eyes. And this is now my God. And this is what I'm worshiping. Right? He's saying, no, 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 no. Courage doesn't have any fear. It only has the fear of the Lord. It's not worried about the circumstance. It's not worried when you see here in Joshua where he says, get ye over the Jordan with this three million people. My servant Moses is dead. It's on to you, bro. You've got you to give us the promised land. And the guy's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Have I not commanded you? That's a good enough word. Just go, man. It's all good. What do you mean it's all good? Besides the Jordan's at flood stage, you might... Note that there's no way to cross it unless the Red Sea happens all over again. All right, so he seeks a man after his own heart. You're going to note that there's courage. This heart has courage, and it is inclined and resolved and determined to do something. If we flip over to, if you go over to Luke 8, I'm going to read you a verse while you're flipping there. Jeremiah 3.15. And I will give you pastors according to my heart. They shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Your heart, you're going to find the heart that has knowledge and understanding is the heart that is going to have a harvest. But notice, I will give you pastors according to my heart. According doesn't sh- show up in the Bible. Um, n- neither does it. Neither neither does the word after show up. It's it's implied by the translation. So it could say, I'm giving you pastors after my own heart, or I'm giving you a man after my own heart. Or I'm, I'm giving you a, a, I'm looking for a man according to my heart. It's interchangeable. That'll give you an idea of what the pastor's actually supposed to look like. Did it tell Abu Luke 8, 13, 8, 15. So we're, so we're in the parable of the sower. Just take a breath under the Holy Spirit. Just breathe in deeply. Breathe in. Holy Spirit, I'm just asking you to fill, to refresh, and to restore. I rebuke cough in the name of Jesus Christ. I just release the peace of God into you right now. Just the shalom of Jesus. Breathe in. Big deep, deep breath. Shalom. Peace. Out of the fullness of God's love and the fullness of God's peace, we just release the, the love and the peace into you right now. Yeah, hallelujah. Shalom. 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 Okay, so the parable of the sower, it starts at 8.5. I'm going to come all the way down to 8.15. The parable of the sower, uh, to just briefly talk about it, is a parable of about four different hearts. The first heart, I rebuke, cough, you leave in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are rebuked, you get out. It's okay. Yes. It's okay. Peace. Peace. We'll do it every day if we have to. Amen. The first heart, the first heart, the first heart, the fowls of the air come. The second heart is a hardened heart. And you're actually going to find that offense is taken in the second heart. In the third heart, it's the cares of the world that come. In the first three hearts, there's absolutely no harvest. If we have time, we'll get into the third heart, but probably next week we'll deal with that. I just want to focus on uh, verse 815, which now then Jesus, after he speaks the parable, then breaks the parable down to his disciples. And he's already spoke about all the different hearts. and, and, And now he's talking about, in verse 15, he's talking about the last heart, where in Matthew and in, in Mark's version, it, it either brings a, a harvest of a hundredfold return, where, which is what it speaks about in Matthew, and in Mark it's 30, 60, or one of the two is 30, 60, hundredfold, and the other it's, it's hundredfold. Here it doesn't quite say that. It says, but on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, this is where we get the revelation that this is the heart that he's talking about, 
which is where we were, David, a man after my own heart, having heard the word, they keep it. And they bring forth fruit with patience. They keep the word of God. I think I gave you the definition to keep, which is to hold fast or to keep firm possession of. Mm -hmm. The root verb is to hold oneself to a thing. This implies something, an intentional plan or effort to steward something. You're going to find that it's the word of God in Joshua that you're going to have to have some kind of a plan to steward. But but but, but remember, if we went back to um, did it if I went back to David, we had did it this heart was inclined, resolved, or determined. And over here, it speaks of this honest and good heart as keeping something holding fast, determined or resolved to keep firm possession of, uh, to hold oneself to a thing. This is to, to is accountability. Um, and it, it's obviously, I think we can infer that it's implying that there's some intentionality here, that this heart is intentional. It's resolved. It's determined. It's determined. And the reality is we have two identities set before us, life and death. You have the identity of Adam, and you have the identity of Christ. Once you've given your life to Christ, you have both of these still set before you. You have access to the life of Christ, but whom you serve, that's whose servant you are. That spiritual law is still in play, and it's revealed in Romans, of all places, not the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. And so I can still participate in the body of Adam or the identity of Adam where there is no authority, there is no power, there is no influence, and there is no dominion mandate. It's all been stolen from this identity. And so th you're going to find that the resolution and the determination is, I want to identify what this identity is, what are the characteristics of this identity, and what is Satan's weapon to try to get me to swerve from my deliberate and intended course and to end up back in Adam where he now has rendered my myself without power and without authority. And I'm sitting here thinking that I'm going to have um, a, a home given to me because God's called me to Woodland Park, but I'm functioning in Adam, and there is no provision for housing in Adam. There's only death in Adam, right? And, and if I'm deceived, which is what the enemy does, and I reside and play around over here while I'm resolved or inclined to be over here, I'm, I'm in this position where I'm starting to get pretty frustrated that my prayers aren't being answered, right? And so it's this notion that I'm going to have to identify what this identity is. Karis does an incredible job of teaching what this identity is. And what are the traps that Satan is using to, to lure me over into this identity? And my relationship with the Holy Spirit grows stronger because he's teaching me and instructing me and guiding me. And, and, and when I end up over here saying, hey, you're back in that trap again, and then I have this wonderful gift of repentance via the cross where I can say, I'm still worthy, I'm still welcome, I'm still necessary, I'm still without sin, even though I'm in Adam, which is the beautiful gift that's a too good to be true news. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I can repent of that behavior, which has changed the way and say, I want to be over here. God, I'm sorry. And by the way, why don't you put a watch in my mouth that... That, that that prohibits me. That says, "Hey, you're just about to do the stupid thing again," and I can go, "Whoa, I'm about to do the stupid thing. What is the stupid thing?" But I'm not going to go forward until I identify the stupid thing I'm about to do. And then when I realize I didn't do the stupid thing, it's like, "Whoa, I'm still here, and I'm no longer over here." And now Satan has lost one of his weapons forever. That's right. He's defeated. He's a defeated foe. And now you're the person that goes to the person next to you and says, listen, let me show you a thing or two about how the kingdom of heaven, which is at hand, how it operates, and how you function in this identity and guarantee that your prayers are always being answered. Amen. And we're going to teach a little bit about prayer here at the end. We're just going to probably introduce it. And next week we'll hammer into it a little bit harder. Um, but I wanted to, de to demonstrate that in the parable of the sower, it's in the honest and good heart the good heart is a heart, it's a gathos. I don't think I had room to give you, give you the definition here. It's an adjective, and it's of good nature, and it's pleasant, and it's agreeable, but the primary characteristic of it is that which hinders the Antichrist from appearing. That which hinders um, the Antichrist or, or, or Satan from manifesting his presence through temptation and enabling me to, and, and, and deceiving me to step into the wrong identity. 
This honest and good heart has been resolved and determined long enough that it's figured out how to do the dance with temptation. And if we get some time, we'll talk about the purposes of temptation because it has a very real function in this process. Get it to Labodiyat, If you back up to verse 13, since we've introduced the, to- the topic of temptation, uh, they that are on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root. F- for, for a while they believe, but in the time, t- time of temptation they fall away. Notice the word temptation. I'll show you another use of that word temptation. And in Matthew 13, uh, verse 21, it says, verse 20, But he that receives the seed into stony places, the second heart. I just quoted this over here in, 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 in Luke. The same is he that hears the word and immediately with joy receives it. So you have that consistency between the two versions, yet has no root in himself. So there's not a foundation. There's not this understanding of who God says he is and who God is. And there's not this understanding that I need to develop a relationship with God at this point. I've heard some things that are really remarkable, and I've been blessed, and I've experienced God, but I really don't know what the heck this kingdom of heaven is at hand is. And this temptation thing is just drawing me away over and over and over and over again. And I don't have any way to defeat it yet. And it says, yet he has no root in himself and endures for a while but when tribulation and uh, persecution arise because of the word by and by he is offended so we're we're talking about persecution and tribulation uh, and you're going to find that these are instruments that Satan uses to break you that God allows to shape your uh, to, to enable you to be patient or The root verb for patience is meno, abide, which is to abide in the vine. He allows these distractions to occur. Jesus suffered them all just the same way that you do. And and and, and uses it to sharpen your relationship and your ability to actually stand in, in faith. I'll show you that in just a minute. But notice offense is a big deal. All right, let's go over to James 1. Because we've opened this can of worms. We must close it. So we've talked about temptation, right? We've opened up temptation. Honest and good heart, having kept the word. So there's this notion of diligence that we've carried forward and brings forth fruit with patience. And so we've introduced temptation as, as a means that, that destroys the harvest, which means there's no harvest in atoms, that this temptation is drawing you into a fence over here, and that, and that there's this notion that I have to learn, out, learn what patience is because with patience I'll be able to stand in this identity. And if you go over to James 1, temptation and and patience are discussed in the first three or four verses. James, a servant of God. So remember, I'm looking for a man after my own heart. That man was defined as a servant. James is that servant. My brethren, count it all joy. So you're counting it all joy when you fall into various temptations. This is the same word used from back here, back in Luke over to here. Temptation is the enticement to sin, whether arising from desires or outward circumstances. It's the temptation by which the devil seeks to steal your identity or divert your purpose or calling. And notice, James is say, saying, you're supposed to jump for joy when this happens. This is your opportunity. Well, I, I, the only way that this works means I must increase in influence. I must get something out of here. And you're going to see that this is how you increase in authority. This is how you increase in influence. This is how you establish this identity. And the more of that identity of in Christ is established at the soulish realm, the more of this power and authority can flow through you. And... God knows what the enemy is going to throw at your way. He doesn't want to put you into a position where you're going to fall. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to put you into a position where you're going to be able to, to, to withstand the temptation that the enemy is going to bring because he's got to oppose you because you're destroying his plan. You are single-handedly destroying his plan. He's got to oppose that. And, and so God has to teach you how to fight. He's got to teach you how to war. Well, this is the war. It's a spiritual war. That's what we're fighting. It's not a carnal war anymore. 1 Corinthians 2.10. It's not a carnal war. Our, our weapons aren't carnal anymore. The tip of the spear is spiritual. Yeah, you might have a carnal weapon behind it, but the tip of the spear in this fight is always spiritual. Back in the, in the days, 
God taught the Hebrews how to war by hand to take, but that's a type and a shadow of what of how we fight today. It's it's not the way that we fight anymore. This is the war. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, this is to know by experience, that the trying of your faith, this is like the, the synthesizing of your faith, like it's being tried by fire and the impurities are being worked out. The impurities of your faith, which is your faithfulness, the impurities of your faithfulness are being worked out to where I, I, I remain faithful in this identity and then suddenly through unfaithfulness to a principle of God, which is maybe love my neighbor, maybe honor my mother and father, maybe the principle is I am worthy and I keep telling God I'm not. I'm over here. I'm in this wrong identity. We're, I, we're, we're in this wrong identity and so he's trying to work this unfaithfulness out of you so that you can learn to remain faithful which you're going to find is patience as well. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith or your faithfulness works patience, it perfects patience. It renders it fit for a thing. Patience, hupamame, is steadfastness. It's endurance or constancy. Constancy is, is, is a fixed, unshaken determination. Notice how much it sounds like purposeful, resolved, determined. It sounds like that heart that God is talking about from the very beginning. It's the characteristics of a man or a woman who is not swerved from his deliberate, remember that, deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith by even the greatest trials or sufferings. The root verb, hupamino, is the action of abiding or to endure bravely, calmly, ill treatments or to remain. To remain where? To remain in Christ or in the body of Christ or in this identity that I've been given through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It has all power and all authority. The root, the base root verb, mino, is speaking specifically to your state or condition, which is identity, and it means not to become another or different. So he's saying patience is really this notion that you're not going to step from one identity and become a different person. You're going to know what manner of man or woman you are, and you're going to then seek revelation through the Holy Spirit to uncover the pitfalls that Satan keeps using. It's usually an individual. If people have a passion for ministry, people will, he'll run people at you to challenge like your ministry isn't any big deal. Or you, I don't know, you, or your family just like, whatever, you know, you're like a bum pastor. Why don't you get a real job? He'll, they'll be, he'll send people to you to take offense. He wants to try to get you to take offense. And, and, and the way we respond to people has nothing to do with the way they respond to us. We respond with tender, loving care, unconditional love, regardless of how they behave towards us. We have but one response. And... A lot of times, it's to zip our lip and not say anything because the thing that wants to come out is the thing that, that is like, I want to kill you thing. <laughs> and, and I believe that Jesus, I believe that we had one of these moments when, when his, remember, the, the, the gal that brings out, in a, who, who they bring out, the priesthood brings out in adultery and throws him down at his feet, probably naked, and, and filled with guilt and shame, that's his sister. And, and they ask him a straightforward question about the law. And this cat, it doesn't say a word. He bends down. He actually takes an action to uh, away. And then he starts to doodle on the ground or write. I don't know if he writes the law. We don't know what he's doing. But the, he ain't saying a word. And it says he was tempted in all ways. And I'm pretty sure he's fried. As a man, he's honked. Yeah. And what he's about to do, he's thinking sin. You wicked bot to do. Bam. You without the first stone, Jack, I'm going to stone you. You know, I'm going to call fire down from heaven. We're just going to annihilate you right now. You know, but he doesn't say a word. He doesn't say a word, right? And then when he does say a word, it's wisdom. And you're going to find that, 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 this, that this heart ha is, is a heart that wisely understands. And when he looks at, at his sister, he, he doesn't condemn her. He doesn't find her guilty. He doesn't entice her to sin anymore. He says, that's not a good idea because look at how much it's cost you. So don't do that. We, we don't have like all the romantic words that he spoke to her because the Holy Spirit felt these are the important things to say. But, but he nurtured people. He was a nurturer. He says, how I long to gather all my, my, my chicks under my wings. I mean, he wanted to gather her in. So he wasn't like, hey, now, you know, you just didn't do this and don't sin anymore, you stupid broad. That's not what he's saying. He wants to gather her in. So there's, there's a lot more emotion that's probably being shown to her um, than what, she, what is evident in the scriptures. 
you, you sort of have to kind of take a look at other things. So let, let patience ha- have its perfect let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. This verb for perfect is like a pirate's telescope or spy scope, and it's talking about every time you take it out another section, it becomes stronger, right? It becomes stronger and stronger. And he's saying, let this process bear, work itself out. Understand that I've given you this identity, but in the very beginning, it's going to be pretty tough to chill with it. You need to kind of get yourself around a body of people that have already done it once before and can give you some of the tools and can help walk you through it and be a source of encouragement. But at the same time, I'll teach you how to do this. I'll teach you how to do this. And and over time, you'll have more power, more power, more power, more power, more power. Proximity to power is influence. More power, more influence. We take the country back. We take the country back. Okay, so that sort of maybe hopefully cleans that up a little bit. Let's zip forward to Joshua and hope that we don't confuse everybody. So, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all the people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. So, man, this dude has followed Moses for 40 years. He's gone and fought wars. He's, he is his general. But Moses has always given him instruction. He's always received orders from Moses to go do, then he executes orders. He's not the man who creates the orders and then executes. A whole different deal here. And obviously he was probably clearly incredibly fond of Moses. So he's lost someone he loves dearly. He's lost someone that he respected dearly. And now God says, you know, it's up to you, bro. And then he goes on to say, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, upon that have I given you, I, upon that I have given you, as I said unto Moses, verse 5, There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I'll not fail you or forsake you. So you've got a command to do something, which obviously you've been empowered to do it. If God commands you to do something, it would be unrighteous for him not to give you the power and the authority and the dominion mandate to do it. So it's implied that he has the power to accomplish these things, even though it may look daunting to him. And it very well made to us. These are all promises that God has made to us. He could say, there shall not be any man able to stand before the all the, day, all, all the days of your life. Wayne, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. That's a word spoken to all of us, although it can be pretty difficult. But notice here, be strong and of good courage. Here's this notion of courage again. The heart of God that he's looking for is a heart of courage. And then verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. So not only do we have to be strong and of good courage, we have to be very courageous. So, um, and what's the purpose of this courage? And what's the purpose of this strength? So that we may observe to do according to all the law, observe to keep. Remember that this is a heart that keeps, that keeps, right? It, 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 it's a heart. But that, that Luke 8.15, but that, on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word keep, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So right here, this is the same thing that he's, he's being t- telling this man of God, who obviously is a man after his own heart. He's already been chosen. He has to keep it or he has to observe the, the word. It means to guard the word. It means specifically to keep the word. That word observe means to treasure it, to celebrate it. The word strength here means to be firm. It means to re- be resolute. Is this making sense? Yes. Remember, remember the heart that, that was quoted here, but now the kingdom shall not, be, shall not continue. The Lord has sought for him a man after his own heart, a heart that is inclined, resolved, or determined. And here we have strength being resolved, resolute, to become strong. Be very courageous. Courage, courage, courageous, a mat, it's a verb. To be strong, to be alert, it means to be determined. He's going to actually show you how to have this heart. Because right now he's telling him, you got to have this heart, brother. This is what you got to have. He hadn't told him how to get it yet. But he does tell him how to get it, and that's the secret of life. Which Moses, my servant, has commanded you, turn not from it from the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This word prosper, sakal, means to wisely understand or to comprehend. Now, if I flip over to, if I think I know what I'm doing, I'm going to find out in a minute if I have my scriptures right or wrong. Okay, 
verse Matthew, just stay where you are, but I'll just read this verse to you. Matthew 13, 23 is the same as Luke 8, 15. It's the very end of the parable of the sower, and it's where Jesus is explaining the last heart. But he that receives seed into the good ground, or the good heart, is he that hears the word and understands it, which also brings, beareth fruit and brings forth some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some, some thirtyfold. Um, all the other hearts are, un, are unfruitful. This is the only one that brings it. But notice that understanding is part of that heart. Okay, and over here he's saying if you have this strength and you have this courage, which means if you have this heart that I actually have given you um, and you observe to do all according to all the law, that you will wisely understand and you will have this you will have this comprehension and insight that is going to enable you to have success. That's what that means wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate Therein, day and night, here we go. <clears throat> obedience is the objective, the path to obedience, the path to understanding, the path to courage, the path to this deliberate, unswerving, unshakable heart, the path to understanding, and the path to, path to wisdom and comprehension. You must meditate therein, day and night. Then it goes on that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous. This word prosperous is a different verb, and it means to cause to prosper, to, to experience prosperity. Hallelujah. And then you shall have good success. Good success is this other verb that I told you before that's translated prosper. Then you, then you shall wisely understand. Then you will, you will have comp comprehension and insight that will enable you to have success and prosper. Have I not commanded you? We've all received the command. Be strong and of good courage. Now notice here, here's the command. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. And so he, there's this command. You have to have some sort of a pattern here, Joshua. First of all, I'm telling you to meditate day and night. So I'm giving you a command here. And I'm telling you that, that you, you, you dismay you can't take your focus off the cross and put it on your circumstance. That's what you can't do. Because your circumstance you're going to encounter here is Jericho. First of all, you're going to encounter the Jordan. It's at flood stage. Then you're going to encounter Jer Jericho, which is a fortified walled city, and you're not able to get over the wall. So if you start focusing on the distraction, you're going to have yourself a problem here. And he's saying, do not be afraid of the daunting task of getting over the Jordan. Do not be afraid of, of the walls of Jericho. Have I not commanded you? There is a solution for this. And I just haven't revealed it to you yet. But I'm telling you what you need to do to do your part so that you can remain faithful in, in actually trusting God and believing in me is that you're going to have to find some kind of a pattern that enables you to meditate day and night. And that pattern is going to have to create an experience with God because it's only through an experience that we change the way that we think. And you're going to have to have this continual refreshing that is changing the way that you think about your circumstance, which appears very monumental, the idea of trying to take the country back, uh, as, as one example, trying to take Jericho back or good across. The so you're going to have to have something that enables you to have a continual experience with me that produces a revelation of who I say you are, which means, yeah, we can do this thing. It don't matter. My God is bigger than that wall at Jericho. I don't, I don't really care that the water is at flood stage. You watch. God's going to take care of it. And you'll see that in, he'll, he'll prophesy and say, hey, in three days, it's all going to happen, man. Because he's going to be emboldened by his experiences with God. Meditating on the word of God day and night. It's talking about an, you're, going to, you're going to have to have some kind of an intentional plan. And that plan is going to have to be something very simple. It's very manageable, very achievable. It needs to be realistic. It needs to be something that, that is uh, um, relevant to your life so that you actually want to do it. And it needs to have something that's time sensitive so that you actually have th this experience that's measurable where you see progress in your attack on whatever mountain is in front of you. Amen. And so sometimes we face bigger mountains than we face other days. And so you're going to have to have some kind of a plan that's battle-tested, 
that you know exactly how it functions and how it operates, and, and this is what I do when I'm confronted with a situation. This is what I do. And this is how I roll, and it works every single time. Now, I may deviate from my core plan throughout the week, depending on what my circumstances are, because I'm in this romantic move with God where he's taking me through the, the Bible in a different way, but all of a sudden, boom, the devil manifests with a temptation or a circumstance that I didn't expect, and suddenly it's like, or maybe it's three circumstances at once. And you're like, well, all right, I know exactly what to do. I'm going to go back to the Jesus challenge because i got a plan. And I know what works. And I've got something that will get me through no matter what. A disciple of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> I often equiv equ uh, equate it to the Army Rangers. The Army Rangers or uh, Special Forces... The, one of the things in the characteristics, I watched an interview with some of the leadership in the Special Forces, and it blew me away when they started to define how, how they operated and what made them special. Because I thought it was because they could hit a bullseye 10 out of 10 times. I thought it was because of their proficiency in, in, in their supersonic strength, or they were like the super soldier. And he goes, no, man, we ain't the super soldier. What separates us from everybody else is that our discipline, our determination, and our resolve. We do things a certain way. And we don't swerve the way that we do them, regardless of the circumstances that we face. We know what we do. Our enemy breaks down in fear. And they, and they don't maintain discipline. Our disciplined approach allows a handful of us to destroy 50 of them. It's discipline, 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 discipline. The disciple is someone who is disciplined. And they're determined and they're resolved to see a certain thing happen because God has made a promise. I will teach you, I will instruct you, and I will guide you. You seek relationship with me first and foremost. I promise you all these things will be added, but I'm also giving you the desires of your heart. And we might as well try to transition into prayer for the last 15 minutes we have here. Psalms 37. I've made you some promises. Okay. Psalms 37.1, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. He's talking about the government of the United States right now. If you oppose the president and the leadership of this country, even the leadership of the state of Colorado, he's saying, don't fret yourself because of evildoers, neither be envious of the workers of iniquity. And if, if I drop down to verse 8, it says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself anywise to do evil. So there's a big promise in the middle, but it's sandwiched by a couple pretty significant statements. And this is where a lot of people blow it. I'm a Christian, and I can identify that this individual is acting ungodly. Well, good, you have wisdom. You have, you could, what do you do next? You love your enemy. You pray for the guy. You've identified a guy who likely is going to hell. Your responsibility is to intercede and to pray. You have a weapon to, for him. But if you start to judge him and go, that he's a liar, he's a liar. Who, who is the accuser? That's Satan. You start to do Satan's job. You're the one instead of pointing the finger at yourself saying, Father, what can I do to help in this situation? Is there anything I can do or pray for in this situation? Because it disturbs me greatly. And it breaks my heart to see this happen. What do I do here? My relationship with God where I let him work within me and, 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 and then tell me how to pray if I'm to pray for this situation as opposed to saying, look at that, look at that, and then telling my neighbor through gossip and innuendo, look at that, look at that, cast dispersions. What, God says there's six things that are an abomination to him, and that's one of them right there, pointing the finger. And instantly I've moved from one identity into Adam. And I think that I'm going to actually make a difference because I know all about the history of my country. I can't save my country from Adam. My weapons aren't carnal. I can only save my country and overthrow tyranny from, from, from this revelation. George Washington was saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. He had a revelation of God. So did the founding fathers. They functioned in this identity, and they had an unswavering commitment to the moral principles of Christ and the rule of law, the proper just rule of law. But the proper and just rule of law couldn't flow out of a society that's immoral. It would have to flow out of a moral society. So you see a handful of guys that unite, 
that God has noticed that they're men after his own heart, so he puts them into a position of influence, and then he, des- he delivers them from a king of England. And in the end, the, win of the, the winning of that victory took the French army and the French navy and the Cuban women to give us the money to fight the war. It wasn't our money. It wasn't our navy because we didn't have one. And 9,000 troops in the end. There was 14,000 troops, 17,000 troops that surrounded Cornwallis at Yorktown. 9,000 of them were French <laughs> under French leadership. Pretty crazy, huh? That's crazy. <laughs> God delivered them. I could read you some quotes right now from George Washington and John Jay where they say there was only one thing that we could hope for and put our trust in, and that was God, because what you saw, well, there was nothing you could put your trust in this way. We had but one hope, and that was God to deliver us based on what he said in the Bible. Okay. Verse 2, 37 two, For they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. We're going to talk about trusting the Lord next week in detail. Trust the Lord and do good. You're going to find doing good is love your neighbor. So you shall, do, so you shall dwell in the land. Remember this notion of dwelling in God, dwelling, patience, and being established. And verily you shall be fed. All wonderful things, but they are contingent on trust and doing good. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So he's the one giving us the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him also, and he shall bring it to pass. So I'm giving you the desire. You've got to recognize it's my desire. Then you have to have some kind of a plan because I've given given you a word that I'm going to bring it to pass. But it's only going to happen in this identity. So you've got to have some kind of a plan that is going to enable you to communicate with God, that, that is, that is to, to, to understand and steward these desires. And with that, why don't we... Um, we've got ten minutes left. I want to pivot into prayer. And I'm going to pivot into the Jesus Challenge. And, I, and, and I'm going to be really broad-brushed with this thing. But first of all, I want to make a simple statement about prayer. The purpose of prayer and the purpose of God giving you these desires is to change your heart, to become consistent with His heart. And the moment your heart becomes consistent with His heart, it would then become inconsistent for Him to not give you the desire that He's placed on your heart. So he understands that he's placed his spirit in you. He understands that your heart is broken. Luke 4, 18, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, declaring his ministry, because, or for this cause, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. The very first thing he's to do after preaching the gospel to a narrow window of people is to heal the broken heart which we've discovered is in the soul. It's the inner man. It's the seed of courage. And he's come to do that very work. Jesus is still the healer. He's still the minister. And he's performing this ministry through the Holy Spirit now. And so he uses the desires, right? He puts a desire out there that says, wow, that's a carrot. That's something I want. I want that. Because he makes it a desire of yours. You now want this thing. Now, he could, uh, shelter is something that you're going to want. A nice car, maybe, is something that you want as well. But he places these desires on your heart, and then he's giving you commands to pray for them. Meditate on my word day and night. Pray c- without ceasing is what Paul says. Pray without ceasing. And so you've got to have some kind of a plan that's measurable where you don't keep praying for like two weeks and go, well, I don't know what the heck that's all about. And you throw in the towel. Two days before you're going to get the thing. Because who comes to steal the harvest? The enemy. He knows you're pursuing God. He's not blind. He's not omnipresent. But he does get a clue. Those people that are absolutely trying to pursue this identity, they have a different drumbeat. He knows what that sounds like. He's been around. He knows the people that threaten him. And he sees how they behave, and he sees their resolve, and he sees their determination. And he knows what God has already spoken over them, and the only thing that he can do is distract them or or, or tempt them over here. You've got to have some kind of a plan. I'm going to show you over the next two weeks why the Jesus Challenge and my daily prayer is that plan. 
Get your own plan. I don't care. I'm not selling the Jesus challenge. That is a fact. I'm not selling this. But it works, and everything that's established in Pueblo is established on this fundamental document. They're not interdependent. You don't have to do the one with the other. There are two totally separate things on one sheet of paper. However, they are actually linked very well together. On the front, my daily prayer, restore your shalom, which is a covenant of peace revealed in Isaiah 54. This is nothing but scripture. It's nothing but scripture. Meditate on the word of God day and night. It's nothing but the word of God. It's, it, it's not necessarily taking a whole scripture. It's taking components of scripture and weaving it into a prayer and it's footnoted. But it is tactically arranged in a format to cover all of the bases so that you are functioning in this identity and get a revelation of where you're not functioning in that identity. On the back, the Jesus challenge is a place for petitions. This is where my petitions, my desires that are on my heart, I place before God. At the very bottom of it, your signature and your date is when you have executed a power of attorney and given God authority to fulfill the word of God that he's promised to do. You're going to make the claim, I'm going to meditate on the word of God day and night, and I got at least it's on one sheet of paper, it's not like ten sheets of paper, it's not like the Holy Bible, which is how big. I told God he had to put the Bible on one sheet of paper if he wanted his whole plan to work, and this is what he did. This is like the Bible freeze-dried. When you read this, it expands. It expands. And when you're ministering to other people, they need something very simple that they can engage and have an experience with God immediately. Because that is the only thing that's going to pull them in and give them a revelation of what their identity is. As soon as they get a revelation of God and identity that's different than they thought. This is changing the way that you think. This is repentance. And he immediately remanifests his present using Malachi 3.1 to completely confirm you're turning in the right direction. You're turning in the right direction. And they see their petitions answered. Skin in the game. If you're a salesman, you've got to get your client to have some kind of skin in the game. There's got to be something that you want that's going to entice you into this contract. So what are the desires of your heart? What are the needs that you have today? What are the circumstances that you're challenged with? And when you're ministering to other people, it's the same thing. Is it addiction? Is it fear? Is it, is it depression? Is it thoughts of suicide? Is it finances? Is it money? I don't care what it is. Is it housing? God answers everything. He... He's going to provide everything for everyone, and He's provided a path the blessing flows through that guarantees that it's going to happen. And all we have to have is some simple plan that keeps us in the flow of this blessing, number one. Number two, that also enables us to minister to other people. Amen. Something simple that's not confusing, that doesn't say, hey, go home and read the book of John tonight. What? In the beginning was is, will be, what are you talking about? Who's the messenger? What, 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 what? I mean, John is amazing. If they read John, they're going to get a revelation. But man, that's also a good reason to put it back down because like, I don't have any idea. And if they stumble into some of this Old Testament, fire and brimstone, God killing off whole babies and children and annihilating women that are pregnant, they may just put this thing down and say, you know what, I don't want your God. And you may introduce more confusion on the front end of this thing than is necessary. Because there's already confusion present. The heart is broken. And you're going to have plenty of opportunity to answer these questions without adding to those situations. So... Real quickly, to just sort of introduce the Jesus challenge or my daily prayer, restore your peace. My daily prayer, hence, hearkensing back to Joshua, restore your peace, shalom, right? Soundness of mind and body. This also talks about prosperity. This talks about good success. This talks about provision. This talks about healing. Um, notice in the very beginning, open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Create in me a clean heart, O God, renewed by your Holy Spirit within me. He who offers thank offerings honors me, and he prepares the way that I may show him the salvation of God. I'll, 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 I'll take you into Romans, and I'll show you some things. But, but right away, you're entreating God to get you into this mode of thanksgiving and praise. How did the walls of Jericho fall? Praise. 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 They praise and worship. That's how they felt. When they were praising God, 
They put the band out in front of the army. That's what caused the walls to fall. Praise. And if you go into Jehoshaphat, uh, 2 Kings 17 through 20, you're going to find a story of Jehoshaphat facing an army of, of, of well over a million people that is coming upon him. They're like around the corner. They snuck up on him. And he's not ready for a full-on attack. And ultimately, the day of the battle, he puts the, they, 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 through discernment, put the praise band out in front of the army, and that's when the Lord sets ambushments. That's when the enemy is defeated. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And this thing is right away giving you something to teach from and something to cue you. He who offers thank offerings honors me, and he prepares the way that I may show him salvation. I've given the definition there. Liberty, deliverance, salvation, welfare, safety, rescue, victory, prosperity. Hallelujah. I want that. What can I be thankful for? I'm breathing. But if the first petition is, Father, I want an immediate increase in revelation of your love for me, they're going to get that. And if they turn over here and they start to read their petition, Father, I want an immediate increase in revelation of your love for me, God, I feel that love. And I hear it all the time. And I'm like, wow, I'm so thankful for that. Now, if I were to teach a little more on praise, you'd find that, that, that there's God is embedded in the, in the praise of a humble person. And he, he's specifically his power is there and his presence is there to destroy the works of the devil. And so it, it starts by its very nature in priming the pump so that you start to defend your you start to defend yourself, but you are empowering God to defend for you. You're playing the game by those spiritual rules and laws that they're designed to be played by. That's all that's going on there. Um, I mentioned in Psalms thirty seven, trust the word of the Lord. I'll just bring this down the second sentence, trust in the Lord with all your heart. We'll introduce that next week. And then I'm going to close here because we're at an hour. Notice there's this confession. This would not be considered scripture, but I do believe it's a New Testament confession. Father, please forgive my sins, known and unknown, as I forgive all those who've harmed me. Most people are either struggling to forgive themselves or to forgive other people. Well, this is where they're going to take a little bit of time and start to address some of those issues. They can picture who has jacked them. Okay, look at what you're going to say to them. With your help, I forgive all. I bless all those who have harmed me with revelation knowledge of your love. May they be blessed beyond measure in all things good in the name of Jesus. So all of a sudden, bless, curse not. We'll talk more about this next week, and, 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 and we'll just kind of weave everything back and forth together. We'll mash it all together for a couple of weeks, and, and hopefully it'll bless you. And hopefully I didn't add confusion, but we actually... We actually, we did all right. Did that bless you guys? Yeah.